Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Let's pray and then let's uh, get into word today. Father God, mm. we just we just uh, thank you, Lord, just for this wonderful and beautiful day, this location, Father, and the many the many many of your children here that are seated and, and awaiting your word, Lord. And we just pray, Father, that you uh, help us to open our eyes, open our ears, calm our hearts, Lord, for all the many things that are on our mind, just so we can uh, hear and interpret and uh, just absorb your word this morning. Father, I, I lift our, our pastor up to you in, in prayer. He's a little bit under, uh, uh, not at full full tilt today, so I just ask that you lift him up, hold him up, so that he can deliver your word, Father, get through uh, this message today. We love you and praise you, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, thank you guys for all the prayers that we've had uh, coming our way for my family, and also pray for my son Daniel today. He goes for his full lifeguard certification right at the end of service. He'll zip off to work, and um, it's a really cool thing. I mean, he's done junior lifeguard many times. He's one of our top swimmers in our island here, and uh, and now he's his boss has said he would pay for him to get his full lifeguard certification. So uh, it's a it's just like the Lord's wink. You know how the Lord does those things for us as we walk and serve the Lord. He he it says, you know, you delight in the Lord. What's it say in Psalm 37? You don't make God your delight and he gives you the desires of your heart, you know, and um, he just has ways to fulfill things. Even when we don't have the money to make it work, he he pulls it off. You know, he does these marvelous things. So. We want to keep uh, giving thanks to the Lord and praises to the Lord. Thankful for Dylan, who's been so faithful to, to try to um, video our sermons now the last two weeks. He put it up uh, just the day before yesterday or night two, two days ago it was. And, and within 12 hours, 300 and something people had saw the service here. And I checked it last night. It was up to 588 people. And that's more than we have here, you know, that, that are – Get get to uh, so for a little fellowship, that's a big deal. You know, now, you know, I have come to learn every time you do that, you, you reach out to more souls. Does the, does the devil go? Yay, good job, pastor. You're doing great. Let's just no. So I just kind of brace like John Higgins taught me. Just just get ready for the attacks, you know, and uh, and don't get discouraged because you do get attacked because, you know, if you look at it, if you're doing the Lord's work and you get attacked for it. It's not a uh, it's not a bad thing. You just have to recognize, you know, if you're doing nothing, the devil will leave you alone. He really will. He'll just be like, hey, they're 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 not really, you know, any positive influence on anyone. Leave them alone. But if you're making an impact in somebody's life, I guarantee you will come under some certain spiritual attacks that you'll be like, why is there so much tension? You know, or why is seem like there's this uh, problems. Why are people, why is all of a sudden my neighbor mad at me over the hedges or what, uh, uh, crazy stuff, L little stupid stuff to get us distracted. We don't want to be distracted. As Paul's been writing to the church at Galatia, he saw that this church was being distracted by guys that started creeping in and trying to add to this finished work what Jesus did of, of granting us salvation through faith. And it, it says, we went to Ephesians chapter 2, we saw in verse 8, it's by grace that we are saved through what? Through faith. And it's not a, a, of any sort of works that we could do. It's what Jesus did. When he's hung on the cross, he said, it is finished. And he completed what was required in the law for sin to be taken care of. He paid for our sins. Now, if we take away from that in any way, we, we start to think we're more important because, you know, yeah, Jesus died, but but we're the special group because because we also do special things, you know, to to get God's extra favor. You 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 would be falling into the very pit that the Galatian church fell into. And Paul would say to you, who has bewitched you? Who cast a spell over you to make you think that somehow you could add to the finished work what Jesus already did for you? You know, you don't need to. And that that actually, to me, it's a robbing from the richness of what Christ did. And the and and it's a robbing from the simplicity of what God intended. God did not make salvation this hard, mysterious thing. 
You know, he made it so that all people could enjoy it. But I don't know why there are some men that just feel obliged to take that sweet, simplistic, loving, merciful gift that God has granted us, and they got to make it all complicated. They got to tie extra, you know, chains around the box and, and put padlocks and everything. You can have it, but you got to work your way in, you know. And I'm like, no, you don't get to work your way into this gift. This is just a present, and it's given by God freely. Whosoever would believe, what did God, it say? God so loved the world, John 3, 16, that he gave his only begotten son. He didn't say that he gave his son, that you would believe in him and do a million different works so you could get salvation, right? No, it just says so you'd believe. And that when you believe in him, you might have one thing. What's that gift? Everlasting life. Now, Paul's up against this church that, you know, he's he's going to mention this a little bit later in this uh, this chapter, chapter four, where we are this morning. If you'd like to turn there to Galatians four, we'll, c we'll continue where we left off last week. And um, we got all the way last week to um, verse seven in this chapter. Speaking about how Paul had had recognized God has adopted us now because of our faith that we've placed in his son, he said, you're now heirs, heirs of God. You are adopted into God's family. You have an inheritance that awaits you. And if you didn't get to, to hear last week, just go on YouTube and, and type in words of aloha, Galatians 4, and we'll pop right up. These guys have done a lot of work to make it come right up on the search engine. It'll pop up, and you'll see it, and you can watch the service and learn about our inheritance that God has. He's called, you know, in First John, John wrote, see how great a love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called what? The sons of God. And such we are. He says, we're adopted now. We're in God's family. And if you come from a messed up, broken family like myself, this is one of the most comforting things for our heart to know. Yeah, my, my earthly family might not have had it together so good, but my heavenly family, you know, I'm in God's family now. And and it's not based on how good we are. It's based on how good he is. Like Daniel prayed in the in the Old Testament. He said, God, don't deal with us according to what we deserve. So we'd be in trouble. He said, instead, deal with us according to your great mercy. You know, deal with us because of how great you are, not, not how frail we are and how much we have fallen short. And he actually confessed the sins of of the nation to God and say, God, forgive us. Should we be praying that same prayer today? Lord, forgive our nation, our sins. You know, we, we have sinned against the Lord as a nation. We're turning from the Lord. And, and this morning, I want to ask the Lord to encourage you. This, this stuff that Paul's going to have to address, this is stuff that cuts down to the real, basest, foundational things of our faith. The things that... These are really good things for us as older believers to revisit because it makes us kind of solidifies that firm foundation that we began with. You know, when how many of you, when you heard that Jesus died for you, you received that that knowledge with with great joy in your heart? You went, oh, that's good to hear. You're, you know, something I, I don't have to hard sell the the pure simplicity of the gospel, because when people hear that gospel, it just within their own spirit, it, their spirit resounds, it resonates, it says, that's right. You know, what Jesus did, he didn't add any conditions, he just came and loved us and died for us. And when our spirit comes to learn that, the, the Bible says it brings about this thing called the joy of our salvation. David, when he sinned with Bathsheba in Psalm 51, he cried out, oh Lord, created me a clean heart. He had sinned and he said, e e renew a right spirit in me, Lord, and take not thy Holy Spirit, he said, from me. Cast me not away from your presence. And, and, and then he cried, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. He remembered the day how joyful it was to, to, to understand God wanted to save him. It's a great thing. But we lose that joy when we fall into sin. We forget about it, and we struggle. And there's a lot of backslidden Christians. I don't know if you've run into any of them. 
seems like they're hiding all over in Hawaii. They go to Hawaii to backslide, you know. I'm going to go there. I'm not going to tell anyone I'm a Christian. I'm just going to hide out. And somehow God puts them in my path. Like I just needed an extra challenge for the day or something. But, but the reality is, how many of you know some Christians that are backslidden in their, in their faith? They were once very strong in their faith, and now they've quit going to church. They got offended. Somebody said something to them or or, you know, there are a bunch of hypocrites there. Of course we're hypocrites. We're all like sinners. What do you expect? You, you know, if th that is one of the cheesiest lies that the devil uses to mess up people. You know, he says, can't go to that church because there's a bunch of hypocrites. Bunch of messed up people. Well, of course there is. By definition, the church is a bunch of not well people spiritually. And the reason we gather is because we got to see the great physician for our souls. Jesus is the doctor that doctors us up. You know, if you would think of church rather than a, a museum for for the righteous, don't get that. I, I had a a dear brother that I had the privilege to to, to really speak a lot into his early foundational walk in the Lord, and he went on to become an assistant pastor there in Arizona and. He actually had a misconception. He thought, if I just work with these people for a couple of years, we're going to get through all these silly problems they have, and we're going to make a perfect group. And after a couple of years' time, of course, you know, he obviously didn't get exposed to the idea of ministry that I was. They, you know, a couple of years passed, and not everyone was perfect. And he quit. I don't see any reason to do this stuff. These people aren't going anywhere. And I spoke to him. I said, don't you know that what we do, you know, in the church today, we are a spiritual hospital for all those that are sick, all those Jesus that are weary and heavy laden. Come unto me, he cries, and I will give you rest for your soul. This is a hospital for the hurting. All hurting are welcome because we have the great physician to, to bring you to and our job we're just like the candy stripers you know at the hospital we just help the help out in any way push the cart here have you know get them to the right room doctor will be in in a minute you know it's like we're not the doctor he's the doctor and we're trying to get people to know that and come to him and it's a privilege to do this but the church today somehow they're like oh, jesus is really important he's too busy to see you i'll take care of you like somehow they get to play doctor. You ever met people that like to to do God's job for God? Like he needs help. You know, I mean, poor guy. He's he's just one guy up there. I better help him. Right. He needs my <laughs> if that's your picture of God in your mind that you think God needs your help. I got news for you today. He doesn't. Now, he may include you in the things what he's doing, and that'll be a blessing to you. But don't ever think more highly of yourself like he has to have you on the team or it won't get done. Have you ever run into those people that are they're stuck on themselves? They're, they're so sure. Ah, good thing he has me because without me, man, uh, this, 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 this group would fail. No, without you, he'd just replace you. He, he's not. Well, the Bible says God's hand is not short. That he cannot save. You know, his arm, he like he can't reach to take care. How many of you believe God can take care of all the problems that we face? Amen? He knows how to take care of us. But I think that he is being misrepresented in these days that we live in. We're, we're like not representing God for who he really is. The creator of heaven and earth. By the way, you know, I work with my kids sometimes on little projects they have to do for their school. And, and so does mom, poster boards and layouts and printing and all this stuff to make some little project to explain something that God created. And I think it was more work to make the poster board than it was for God to make the actual thing because he just spoke and it existed. I wish I could do that with their projects. Be done and poof, it would be done. <laughs> Take it in, kid, you know. But when you're God and why... Why do we sell God short? How long did it take him to make everything that we see? Six days, right? The seventh day, what did he do? He says he rested. All right, I'm done. Everything we see made in six days. 
I mean, we're talking even to the farthest reaches of our telescopes and beyond. All of the universe, it says, the psalmist wrote, it fits in the span of his hand, from the tip of his thumb to his pinky. That's how big it is to him. Just a little project. And we're somewhere in the little, you know, our universe is somewhere between that space, maybe over the little middle finger. And then if you zoom in closer, right, you find our sun, which is look, looking like a dot by now. And then somewhere around that little dot is little micro dots hovering, going in little orbits called planets. And we're one of the little blue marbles. You think about how big we are in, in relation to God. Should we not teach how great a God we serve? Because this generation doesn't realize the guy I work for, now, th they'll call me up, oh, no, I don't know if God can handle this. I'm thinking if he quit his job, I'll freak out with you. <laughs> but last time I checked, he still sits on his throne, and I really don't have to worry. Okay? And we need to teach how great he really is. He did the greatest of things by sending his son so we could have salvation. Now, Paul He's already addressed this church and said, who bewitched you? you? You started off by faith and you received God's spirit by that, that just that simplicity of faith. You believed God and God gave you his Holy Spirit. And, 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 and now somehow you think you're teaching that, well, you really get more of the spirit by doing these certain works of the law. Paul says, you poor accursed ones, bewitched ones. You, you have a spell cast over you. He's trying to pull back that, that veil that has been pulled over their eyes. Let me read on with you this morning where we left off last week. He says in verse 8, However, at that time when you did not know God, he said you were slaves to those things which were by nature really are no gods. He says, but now that you've come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how is it that you turn back again to the weak and the and the worthless and elemental things to which you desire? He says to be enslaved all over again. He says you observe days and months and seasons that you're falling back into the Jewish calendar to do all of these rituals. He says, but I fear for you that perhaps I've labored over you in vain. He says, I beg you, brethren, become as I am, for I also have become as you are. He says, you've done me no wrong, but, but you know that it was because of bodily illness that I first preached the gospel to you in the first, the first time. He says, and, and that which was a trial to you in my bodily condition, you did not despise or loathe, but you received me as an angel of God, as, even as Christ himself. He says, wh where, where then is this sense of blessing that you once had? For I bear witness that if possible, you would have plucked out your eyes and given them to me. And, and, and have I therefore become your enemy by telling you the truth? Now, Paul, he's pointing out something that's really interesting. He's actually pointing out the condition of their hearts. That when he first came to them, we, we know just from reading the text here, there was some condition that was, you know, a problem for Paul with his eyes. And... It was, uh, you know, in, hi in the historical writings, not in the Bible, but in the secular writings, there was a, there was a notation, in a man named Josephus that wrote around the time of Jesus. He noted that around the Mediterranean region, if you were along the s seashore, there was a lot of guys getting this thing that, that um, I can't remember the name of it, but it, we, we have a name for this actual thing, but it's a condition where the eyes begin to get an infection. And it makes it to, to what is it? It, it, it kind of makes the eyes to weep and ooze. And um, the only solution they had was go inland, get away from the water, the moisture, go in and to where it's drier, more arid. And for some reason that helped the, um, you know, the body to cope with this oozing. Well, some have suggested Paul might have had that very malady visiting him when he was on his missionary journey. And you'll notice on his missionary journey, his his track as he followed the path on his second journey that he's there and then he cuts inland. 
and goes inland to the drier, what we call the drier highlands, you know, where it's a little bit, it get, might be it. And he's, he says here, I came to you at first because I was suffering. But you didn't treat me bad because I was suffering. You, you treated me like I was sent as an angel of God. You know, he had such compassion and such a, such a sense of blessing. He says, I tell you, you would have given me your very eyes. If that, that's how much compassion you had. But is he saying this in a way that he's commending them on good job? You're, you've stayed compassionate? Now, those of you that read ahead, you already know. L let's just do it and see what he says. He says, now, verse 16, now have I become your enemy by telling you the truth? He said, they eagerly seek you, seek you, not commendably, but they wish to shut you out in order that you might seek them. But it is good always to be eagerly sought in a commendable manner. And not only when I'm present with you, he says, my children with whom I am again in labor until Christ be formed in you. He says, but I could wish myself to be present with you now, but that I could to, to change my tone. He says, for I am perplexed about you. Now, Paul, remember, is writing this epistle from where? He's in jail. He's in prison. And he's, he's perplexed because their attitude has changed. They went from being really compassionate people that cared about him to now they're kind of become judgmental. You ever run into Christians that used to be really merciful and something happened along the way and all of a sudden they're, I don't know, they think God's not really doing the job or something, so they're going to help him out. Let me help you out, God. I'll help you judge. These people are screwed up. You know, they, they need some fixing, you know, and <laughs> I remember when a man came to me a few years, my elder came to me and I was I was, you know, I, I had the privilege to start off young in ministry. And I had been here a few years pastoring the, the work. We had founded the first Calvary Chapel here in in Kona. And this man actually came up to me and said, you know, you have a lot of messed up people in your group. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, your point. And he. He went on to tell me, he says, well, you know, you don't really tell them what to do. You know, these people are screwed up. You need to tell them what to do. And I could tell, now, just because I was raised a military brat, this, there's something about kind of an ease to spot people that have military exposure, you know. There's just certain drills you get drilled into. Place for everything, everything in its place. And, you know, there's just certain codes of ethics and how you, you know, you you conduct yourself, and I could tell this guy maybe was in ROTC. <laughs> Not quite full mil military, but he had some exposure to this, and he had it in his mind that somehow he needed to straighten up this messed up group. And he needed to take over for me, because all I did was tell him to go to Jesus and do what Jesus told him to do. And that wasn't good enough. I need to add some extra rules, get some order, some discipline, you know. We got to get these people whipped into shape. It's like a, he wanted to run spiritual boot camp. And he didn't understand this is not boot camp. This is the hospital. You know, in fact, this is the mobile hospital. We're the mash unit for the Lord. You, know, you guys that watch mash, remember that? With Hawkeye and Pierce and those guys, you know. They're, they're just under tents out there in the front lines. And when the wounded come, who do they get to go visit first? The mass unit, right? They get them to there and, and fly them in. Radar, here's the helicopter coming. Here he comes, you know, and, and he a, a, a incoming, and they all jump to. And that was the most. Uh, how many of you have seen that show, MASH? You know, we used to watch this all the time when I was younger. You know, it really is going to sound funny, but God showed me some interesting parallels to what he desires to do for people. He he sees people that are spiritually bleeding out. Like they've just stepped on a landmine in this life and, and, and their legs got exploded off. And this fella would have said, you need to do push-ups, you know. You need to get in shape. And, and I said, look, he doesn't have legs, you know. His arm's blown off. And he doesn't need to do push-ups. He needs someone to put him on a stretcher and get him right in to see the the emergency guys that can stabilize him, and they're not really the ones going to do the full-out surgery. They're just the ones that try to help keep him alive long enough to get him back 
to the hospital, right? I see our role as our little fellowship out here on the beach. We're, we're, we're a mobile army spiritual hospital. We're, we're the mass unit for the Lord where we're getting to be on the front lines. And there's people that are, they don't need to be whipped into shape. They're hurting so bad right now, they're bleeding out. They need someone who cares enough to help pick them up and help put a tourniquet on and, and cut, s- s- preserve their lives. And the only way that you're going to get that compassion to do that, Paul said that these guys had become tainted. Something had changed in them. They went from having those eyes of compassion that he said they would have given the, their very eyes to him to now he says, I'm perplexed. What I hear about you, you wh- where did that sense of blessing go? Now, what did they start doing? They started to fall under the law. They started adding to the finished work of Jesus. They started making it more complicated than the scripture declares. And I don't think we're supposed to do that. I think what that does is it it makes Jesus harder. It's like putting him out of reach of the people who need him the most. And that's not what he would want. Look what Paul said. I need to back up to, to two of the first verses I read to you. Go back to verse 8. He says this. He says, however, at that time when you did not know God, you were slaves to those things which by nature are no gods. But now you have come to know God. Or rather, now pay attention here, or rather to be what? Known by him. Doesn't, this is one of the verses that, I've just shared this recently with the kids. I think even with some of you adults, I've shared this idea that it's not really important that we claim that we know God. That doesn't get you into heaven. That's like saying, I know that president, the president's Barack Obama. I could go up to the White House, right? Knock on the front door. Let me in. You, do you think Secret Service is going to let me in because I say I know who he is? Let's say that. <laughs> they'll arrest you is what they'll do. Cart you off to a loony bin thinking you can just walk up and get in. But, but. If the fellow who's in charge knows you, and I've shared this before, if Barack Obama knows you, you you happen to know him when he was here in Hawaii and you were neighbors and he sees you out on the front lawn, you're passing by and he's inside and he looks, oh, look, I, I, Holland, how you doing? You're, you're, you're my friend from Kona. Oh, if he knows you, he could just say, let him in. Now, when you're the guy in authority, can you do that? Yeah. It's not a matter of if you know him, it's a matter of does he know you. And this truth is the same when it comes to the heavenly principles. It's not a matter if you say, I know God. That doesn't get you in. What gets you in is, does he know you? Now, when I read this in the gospel, how many of you, when you were a new Christian, started reading the New Testament from the beginning? Matthew. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Some of you were encouraged to read John's gospel first, but... I was one of those ones, I just cracked it open and started at Matthew. And I started reading the Gospel of Matthew, and I got to this story about this ten virgins. Five, it says, were wise, five were foolish. And the five wise ones, it said, kept their lamps with with the wick trimmed and the oil full, and they had extra oil, and they were waiting for this wedding feast. So that when the bridegroom called, come, you know, time for the, the wedding, they were ready to jump up and, you know, trim their lamps and uh, uh, the wicks and 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 fill to the oil and get into the to the wedding procession. And they get up to the wedding procession. They 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 go all the way up to the gate and and they're let in and they go in to enjoy. Now, what a what a cool. And who's telling this story, by the way? Do you guys know this one? Uh, Let me show you some. I, I like. For me, I, I love these these things in the Word of God, but so, some people say, where where is that? Like last week, someone came and asked me, where's the thing about the sheep and the goats? You know, you said the, there's going to be sheep on one side and goats on the other. And I, th- I think it was last week or the week before. That's Matthew 25. But this is before that. This is this is in, in, in Matthew. Well, this is earlier in the same chapter, actually. It's it's just it's just before this. 
the beginning of Matthew 25, the sheep and goat things at the end of this chapter, the, the story of the ten virgins is at the beginning. And in Matthew 25, I want to read this to you. It says, Then the kingdom of heaven will be comparable to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were foolish, but five were prudent. And those that were foolish took their lamps, but they took no oil with them. But the prudent ones took oil and flasks along with their lamps. Now, while the bridegroom was delaying, they all got drowsy and began to sleep. But at midnight, there was, a, there, it, it, there was the call, Behold, the bridegroom comes. Come out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish one said to the prudent, Give me some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. And the prudent answered and said, no, there will not be enough for us and for you too. Go instead to the dealers and get some of your own oil. And they went away to, to go make the purchase. And it says, and while they were gone, what happened? The bridegroom came and those that were ready went in with him to the wedding feast and the door was shut. Now later, the other virgins also came to the door. They, they said, Lord, open up for us. And this voice declared, it says, Jesus said, but he answered and said, truly, I say to you, I do not what know you. Therefore, Jesus said, be on your alert, for you do not know the day nor the hour. Be ready for that coming of the Lord. And, and, and this is an admonition to the church because, guys, we're. We're supposed to be those lights. Let, Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they'll see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Do you guys realize that you may be the only light of the Lord, the only, the only illumination to so They may never read the scripture. They're looking at your life. How you live is the demonstration of God to them. And we can't really shine brightly for for the Lord, if, if you look, the analogy says we're, we're a, like a lamp. But what does the lamp need to, to burn brightly? The oil. And in the Old Testament, what was the oil representative of? The Holy Spirit. You know, Jesus said, I'm, don't, they were all sad he was going to leave. He said, don't be, let your heart be troubled. I go to the Father. And it's to your advantage, he says, I will send you the Holy Spirit. And I told the kids this just last night, the College and Career Age kids, that, you know, when Jesus was on this earth, he was stuck in one location with just those guys around him. But he says, guys, it's to your, they were all bummed when he said, I'm leaving. But he said, well, when I leave, I'll send my spirit. Now, is the Holy Spirit bound to one location? Can he only be with just one person at a time? No. He can be with all of us. That's why it's to our advantage. We get this spiritual oil, the oil of God's spirit, his Holy Ghost, that Helps us to burn brightly. Now, the foolish virgins, they had the lamp, but what were they lacking? The oil. You know, some Christians today, I hate to say this, especially in Western Christianity, we actually teach all you need is Jesus and you don't really need the Spirit. Th did you know there's groups that actually teach, yeah, those things of the Spirit, well, we believe they had that back then because they needed it, but we don't need that today because, you know, we have the fullness of all understanding and I can't even fathom that to me that's one of the most talk about cheapening the gospel. You know, that takes away all the all the power that's available to us as I mean it's his spirit says that gives us strength, right? His spirit gives us comfort. His spirit leads us and guides us and teaches us. You know one thing is really cool is that you know, Aaron and I, we laugh sometimes, or, or Will, Will is over there teaching Sunday school. Last night, he, he showed up. My mouth was hurting so bad. I said, Will, I'm, I am in La La Land, first of all. I'm on this painkiller, and I'm like, I, I stand up, and the whole room kind of goes, woo. And I'm like, I don't like it. And the, the doctor's like, you don't use any drugs, do you? And I'm like, uh, no. Like, they almost make you sound like you're bad because you don't do it. But they're like, you're so s sensitive. Well, good, you know, fine. But but I'm like, Will, uh, only ver I was praying, what should should I teach? Lord? Like, my mouth hurts. And all I can think of 
you keep reminding me of this verse, what you said in John's gospel. If Jesus said, if you ask anything in my name, ask anything in my name that your joy may be made what? Full. And you know, there's a lot of Christians today that have backslidden. That sin has crept into their lives and the joy of their salvation that they once have has diminished. And the sad part about that is there's a direct correlation. The joy of the Lord, the psalmist declares, is our what? Strength. If you don't have joy, guess what happens to your spiritual strength? Your meter just goes, <laughs> you know, <laughs> flat line. Uh, it's dead. And they have no there's there's so many Christians today struggling like, I just don't have any strength. I don't have any joy. Well, pray like David. Lord, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Maybe you got sucked into a group that taught you you had to do a bunch of push-ups for Jesus. You had to do spiritual works. You had to go on missions. You had to teach Sunday school. You hate teaching Sunday school, but they make you. Have you ever run into some Christian that had that experience, by the way? They'll, they'll, they'll generally backslide. Nothing worse than putting a Christian in that is not their calling to teach Sunday school. The kids know right away. Like, oh, they stink, Dad. I, I have inner spies, my own kids tell me. You know, they are not called to teach Sunday school. When the person is called to do it, something about when it's that thing what God has called you to do, when, when you are really called to teach Sunday school, there's a joy that you get, even though it's a lot of work and it can be a headache and the kids can be out of, you know, unruly. You get done, and you're just like, wow, that was cool. You know, Mary's been in Thailand now over three years, teaching English as a second language to the orphans there. And she, she shared with me that a year ago, she prayed with a young boy to receive the Lord. And that, that was like one of the most glorious, after two years of laboring there, she's thinking, am I really making an impact? We had her on, on the FaceTime while we were doing the study on Friday night. And so she's listening in, and she shared that that little boy has shared Jesus with his whole Buddhist family, and now they have all become Christians. So I go, so was it worth it to take that time with that one little kid? Now there's a whole family that has been introduced to salvation. What a glorious thing. I mean, this is, this is what it's all about. And... To be honest, I don't think she could have done it without God's spirit strengthening her because she's had a lot of ups and downs and struggles. And, and the Lord, when he gives us his spirit, his spirit gives us a, a, it's like a spring, a well of living water. It says it springs up within us. And it brings life and, and refreshment and, and excitement to our whole Christian walk. And why would the church teach, yeah, they used to have that fountain available, but it ain't around anymore. I mean, who came up with that wicked teaching? Of course, God's the scripture says God, Jesus is the same yesterday, today and what? Forever. If he's the same, do you think the Holy Spirit changed? He morphed? Oh, yeah, he was real powerful back then, but he he gave up his powers. Or he's not really around. That is a lie. The devil wants you to believe that the the Lord I serve. He told me, be wise, like one of these wise ones. Because the wise ones, it said, kept an extra flask of oil. They didn't just get enough to put in their lamp. They had extra so that as it burned down, they could, could, they could get a refill. And they, were, they had that oil of God's spirit in their lives. And when the, when the bridegroom called and said, come on in, they were ready to go in. Now, the other ones still were lamps, but what was missing? The oil. You know, it tells me this parable says basically oil is pretty important. You know, and if that oil represents the spirit, then, then the Holy Spirit is important for you. You need his spirit. You know, Paul would write to the Corinthian church. Don't you guys know that your body is a temple? A temple for what? The Holy Spirit. You know, God is so cool. He has not ordained that, that his spirit dwells in buildings, physical buildings, but rather that he dwells in us. And we're the portable buildings for God. When someone is in, in need, God can say, Jan, I need you over there. 
and he could just send his spirit in this contained vessel, this lamp full of oil, and say, bring life to them. They need it. And, and he can move us into place where we're, have any experienced those, what those divine appointments I was talking about where he puts the person right in front of you and he gives you, oh gosh, you even say verses you didn't even know you memorized. They just come pouring out. Anyone ever had that happen? You're, t you're sharing something about the Lord and you, out comes a verse and you're like, I, when did I memorize that? You know, just flow. That's his spirit. When people say, prove to me there's a God. I like you don't understand how m how many times he has brought to my remembrance things that Christ has spoken. I know there's a God. He he can quicken my mind when I'm in the foggiest of state. He can still make it come out. And I've come to learn that, you know, I'm like, Lord, I don't know what to share tonight. It's Friday night. I'm all loopy on these painkillers. And only thing you said is ask in Jesus name. Up to then, they had not asked in his name. And Jesus said, try this. Ask in my name anything of the Father and see what he does. That your joy might be what? Full. Why don't we teach this next generation that if they need something, just ask God in whose name? Jesus's. And let God answer. And God could, will God answer when we ask? Did he make it? Ask and do 10 spiritual push-ups. You know, do some steps of the law. No, he said, just ask. What did Jesus say? Ask and you shall, might, maybe receive. You know, ask and you might possibly have it, give it, no. Knock and maybe someone will open the door. No. What did he say? You ask and you shall receive. You knock, what happens? The door will. You, you, all you have to do is seek, Jesus said, and you shall what? You shall find we, we made it too mysterious, too hard. And when I read this verse about these virgins that he says, depart from me, I, I do not know you. This was I was a new Christian. I freaked out. I was like, and then you read further in the chapter and he he's the great judge that separates the sheep from the goats and all the sh sheep on the right and all the goats on the left and to all the sheep. Come in, you, you you know, when I was hungry, you fed me. And when I was thirsty, you gave me to drink. When I was sick and in prison, you visited me. And they said, when did we do that? When you did, did it to the least of my brethren, you did it to me. And I read that. And, I, and the other guys, he says, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. When I was sick, when I was hungry, when I was thirsty, you didn't take care of me at all. No compassion. Depart from me. Now, I read this chapter, and I was freaked out. I was like, I never want to hear Jesus say, depart from me. And I never want him to say, you're not coming in. I don't know you. It set me on a course to read this book to find where is the verse that says how to make sure that he, it's not me know him, okay? That's not it. I need the verse that says he knows me. Now, I've shared this before, but if you're new to the faith, I don't mind repeating myself. Peter did it all the time. Who can tell me where it is? There is one verse. You got it. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Start in verse 2. If any man supposes he knows anything, what's it say? He knows not yet as he ought to know. In other words, we don't have it all down. But the next verse, verse 3 of 1 Corinthians chapter 8 says, But if any man loves God, he is known by him. It doesn't say if any man went to seminary, or if any man went on missions, or if any man gave to the church, or if any man did taught Sunday school. No. If any man studied to know God, then God will know him. No. It simply says, if you love God, then you are known by What is the greatest commandment when that lawyer tested Jesus? What was the answer? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all of your strength. And the second is like unto the first. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's all there is to it. We need to quit making it so complicated. 
We need to tell people, just love God. You'll be known by him. And that's what really counts in the big scope of all that I ever teach. If I do not teach you to love God, I fail. Because he'll say to you, depart, I don't know you. You don't love me. Does, can he tell who loves him? Is it, I mean, the Bible says he's our heavenly father. We studied last week. We cry out, Abba, Daddy. We have the greatest spiritual father. But, you know, we're not perfect as earthly parents, but can you tell when your kids are smoozing you <laughs> for something? Is that okay to say? Like, you know, they're, they're, they're putting on the, 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 um, the extra niceness. Oh, Daddy. And they s snuggle up in your lap, you know. And I'm like, what do you want? I mean, come on. You, it's a giveaway. They're not that nice normally. They rub your shoulders a little bit. Can I ask you something? Now, my kids know I love it when they rub my shoulders. Or it, when I'm in pain, I don't know. It's just it's very comforting someone to just, you know, rub the back of the neck a little or, or the hand, you know, just grab your hand and rub it like that. My mom was a chiropractic masseuse, so I learned all these pressure points and stuff. And when I was hurting, my mom just could come up and just go like this, touch you a few places. She would tell, like, where those spots are. And oh, my gosh, you didn't even know there was a sore spot. And she'd find it. And she'd just gently rub, and, and that pain would go away. Anyone had that happen? I'd be like, melt. Yeah. But when my kids do it, who never do it. And, and I'm, I'm grateful. I'm not going to turn it down. But I'm like, hey, what do you want? We can tell when somebody is operating, at least most of the time, under false, uh, what's that word, pretense? Yeah. What makes you think God can't see right through your smoke screen when you're sitting there trying to snow him? Oh, God, I promise if you get me out of this one thing, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be good from now on. You know, how many times do you think God heard that? <laughs> if I don't teach you to love God, I really have failed. Because I want every one of you to hear from him someday. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter. What did Jesus going to say? Enter into my rest. Anyone here learned about that there's a rest that he's going to give us? His peace, his rest. Come enter into that. Boy, if that is not something our souls need in this day, with all of the things that, you know, freak us out and on the news and, and the bombings in Paris and all the stuff going on, it, we need to have that comfort of God's spirit guarding our hearts you know the Bible says his spirit guards our hearts and minds with a peace far beyond all human comprehension and I want to tell you that spirit is still real and if you don't have it you need to start filling up your little extra container and if you just got a little bit to light the light but it's not going to stay lit you need to ask him for more and as we close today we want to just give you opportunity. If you need prayer, maybe maybe someone listening is backslidden. You know what the prophet cried out in the Old Testament? He said, come back. He, all you backsliders. I learned this from Pastor John Higgins taught me this too at men's prayer. He used to say, he'd be praying. God, we agree with the prophet. His prayer. To all you backsliders, come ye back to the Lord. Come out of your backsliding. What would happen to the church today in Kona? If all the backsliders up and down our coast came out of their backslide. I mean, we would fill in every chair in every fellowship. We would be overflowing. That's how many backsliders we have in Hawaii. But do you think it's just here in Hawaii? No. The Bible says in the last days, the love of many will wax cold. They're, they're turning away from the Lord all over the place. But as you see the day draw near, how many think the coming of the Lord's getting closer? Do we have any signs, wars, rumors of wars, pestilence, famines, earthquakes? I mean, we have every single one. Just read the next couple chapters of Matthew from where we just left off, and you'll see we don't have, like, any guarantee we're going to be here next week, which doesn't bum me out. 
I mean, if the Lord comes for his church, I'm out of here. But if you don't go in the rapture, I got news for you. You better, you better really cry out for his spirit because there's going to be some bad stuff coming down the pike. I look forward to that coming of the Lord. The whole New Testament ends with this verse. The grace of the Lord be with you. Even so, what did John pray? Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Even so, let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for this glorious day that you've given us, this beautiful day out on the beach. I want to thank you for that nice breeze that's blowing through this place right now. And I ask that by, by your Holy Spirit's work in each of us, that even as that, that sweet breath of uh, uh, what, what in Hebrew, the meadow, the, your breath blowing over the land, Lord, that it would be accompanied with the breathing of your spirit to every believer here, that we would get a f our lamps full, our, our extra flask full to overflowing from you. Just give us a portion of your spirit that we could shine brightly for you. Lord, guard us. Protect us from the, the things that the enemy would put before us to stumble us. Lead us not into temptation, you said, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo and God bless.